I've been wanting to do a video like this since the very first video I uploaded, I don't know, however many months ago. Your nails are dirty, the table is messy, there's stuff from fixing computers and stuff. Even a razor, I don't know why. But that's not important. This video we're gonna talk about World number one, Novak. He looks like a troll in this picture. Novak Djokovic. Don't say any of those things, okay? Just, just fair warning. Uh, those are Serbian swears. I'm Serbian, so I feel like I can say those things and get away with them. It's just a joke for other Serbian people. Okay, so a lot of people on the internet will go to town arguing until the cows come home about Novak Djokovic's racket or TM's racket or Roger Federer's racket. Good, that's a good first step because at least you're aware that, you know, they're not using a stock racket from off the shelves, which, but they're arguing about the specs and that's good, you know, like, you know, in terms of relationally how that adds up to angular frequency for Novak versus you, uh, there's a huge gap there, which is a problem that we'll have to discuss in another video. The main thing I want to talk about here is understanding conceptually what Novak's racket, they can't conceptually take what is going on with his racket and apply it to how he plays. That's, that discussion doesn't happen at all from what I've seen. And it's really sad because that's really what can make you play better. That's what you should care about rather than whether it's 373 or 371, whether everyone else on the forum is gonna think you're cool and smart or not. Like that, that's, that's pointless. So in my tennis book of secrets, I have extracted for you some interesting points. And just, just before we start, these are opinions that I've come up with based off researching and testing this equipment and speaking to people who've worked in the industry and finding out what he actually uses and just trying it and getting feedback from you, from even play testers to recreational players to uh, former pros to everything in between for over the past two years specifically, but all together over the last seven or eight years of just modifying rackets. Anyway, so first off, I think generally everyone will agree his swing rate is about 370. Uh, in other videos, people are going to disagree with what I have to say, but the, for this one, it's pretty concrete. He's been using about a 370 swing weight, 373, whatever. Um, there's differences between machines. So one machine might say 373, one might say 371, say it might say 371. It doesn't really matter. Conceptually, we can, we can ballpark it at 370. That's fine. He's basically been using this specification, these specs, like this high twist weight, high swing weight, not super high static weight since at least 2008 at least when he was with wilson and when he switched back to head he went back to that liquid liquid metal radical sort of frame and they added all the weight to the sides or whatever but basically he's always had a 370. i don't know about the twist weight when he was with wilson but since he came back to head for first of all let's take a sidetrack and talk about this swing weight and compare it to other players that we know about Soderling had a 380 now bandian had a 370 uh, Murray, who is very much his peer, I would say they're very, very close in a lot of ways. He was at 400 plus one at one point. And what does this swing weight, what does this high, super high swing weight really do for you? That's something that a lot of people on the internet don't really kind of grasp. They think it just adds power. It doesn't just add power. Like if you get a sitting short ball and you flat hit a ball flat with a high swing weight, yes, you're going to hit more power, you have more ball speed, but it's really about the incoming ball speed that's really where it makes a big difference. To hit through higher ball speeds, you just need more swing weight. That's why you can be limited in how well you play if you're using too low of a swing weight. That's something that a lot of retailers and uh, just people on the internet alike just won't talk about and they don't realize. Everyone thinks that it's all rack head speed, but in fact, but if you try to take a 320 swing weight to a 130 mile an hour serve out wide like Novak Djokovic does, and you try to dink it back with your wrist and try to hit a winner off that, or down double match point against Roger Federer at the US Open, and you try to swing as fast as you can with a 320 swing weight, you're not gonna hit a winner off that with any kind of consistency. And what does Novak do better than anyone else? He's one of the best returners of all time. Funny enough, now Bandian and Andy Murray both are also in that category. I would say now Bandian is probably one of the best, like top three for sure, maybe even the best up there with Andre Agassi, and that goes into twist weight. What did now Bandian do better than almost anyone? When he beat Federer at the World Tour Finals and he had all those great matches, I mean, his fitness is probably the biggest thing, and I don't know, mentally sometimes he's a little bit on or off. 
um, can kind of get a little bit heated and, you know, maybe beat up some lines people. He was able to take the, the Federer pace, peak Roger Federer maximum pace, and just hit through it like it was hot knife through butter off his forehand and his backhand wing. That absolutely had to do with the difference in swing weight. Was it purely the difference in swing weight? No, it had to do with how he used that racket. But without the racket being at this swing weight level, there's no way he'd be able to hit through it. Remember Robin, Robin Soderling, when he, when he beat Rafa at Roland Garros all those years ago? Yeah, that had absolutely to do with his swing weight. The only way you're gonna be able to hit through Rafa like that is with a massive swing weight. That's why Novak can go toe to toe with him. That's why he's been so close for so many years and that's why he's been able to beat Rafa is that he has such a high swing weight, he can hit through all that pace and spin. Without that swing weight, there is no way you're gonna be able to hit through it. You might be able to hit, make contact with that ball with a lighter racket more easily at higher racketed speed, but that's not gonna get you a higher ball speed across the court. Swing weight will do that, especially with a high recoil weight. Andy Murray, same kind of thing. He's, he's hitting through everyone at the French Open right now because he has, I don't know if it's a 400 right now, but he's probably got a higher swing weight than most people. And is it, again, is it purely that he has a higher swing weight? No, it's how he uses that racket. But without that racket, without that piece, there's no way he's gonna do it, especially not with a 320 swing weight, especially not with a 330. But of course, there's a trade-off to this. It's harder to get the racket going with a higher swing weight. That's just how it is. It doesn't mean that you can't have the maximum racket head speed that you did before. It's all about your technique to do that. So you have to adjust. Novak, for example, just how difficult is it to do? Well, that's why Robin Soderling had to wait for a perfect condition day to be able to hit through Nadal. He needed a slow court to get it even slower to be able to hit through Nadal. And that had a lot to do with his technique. He has a very direct on, kind of a longer stroke path, kind of almost golbus -y forehand, and he needs that extra slow court to give him enough time to use that racket effectively. That's why when the court was playing a bit faster, I think that Roger Federer was able, able to trounce him. He just wasn't able to use his strokes the same way. He wasn't able to line himself up. He doesn't have quite the open stance for it. Whereas Novak, why is he so good at that? He's able to use that because he has a fully open stance. I mean, think about it. It's taken him years to get to this point where he's dominating. And I think that that's not simply that other players have dropped their level. I think he's, I think he's grown into his game. We'll, we'll talk about his exact techniques in a little bit at, towards the end of the video. How does this work for him on the court? Well, can you even see that? Well, it's really on his returns. One of the big effects of having a super high swing weight with any kind of decent balance point is that you're gonna have a really high, this is really shaky, sorry. You're gonna have a really high recoil weight and that's just gonna give you way more stability on the return. Do you think this has a huge impact on his ability to return serve? Because with such a high swing weight and such a high recoil weight, he doesn't have to swing all that fast into the ball to get power through that ball. He's able to take those 130 mile an hour serves and just blast them back. Wow, this is really hard to see. This gold, this gold color was kind of a bad choice. I mean, think about all those times he's been able to return those big out wide serves just by wristing the ball. If you do that with a regular racket, you're not gonna get the ball back nearly as fast. It's not black magic, it's his swing weight. I promise you, especially in combination with those natural gut strings, but it's mainly his swing weight. And the big thing about it is that he can take a lower racket at speed and get more power back. Why is that lower racket head speed important? Because it makes it easier for you to time the ball. The problem with light rackets is that if you want to get enough power to hit through a he really fast, heavy ball, is you have to tie swing faster. And that makes timing the ball more difficult. Over the course of a match, even the course of a, of a set, that's going to reduce your chances of making those fast balls back in. So that's really key to understand conceptually. And that's something that you can apply to your own tennis. Him using a 370 swing weight versus Roger Federer, at least in the past when he was for sure using a low 350 swing weight, which I know someone's probably gonna be like, no, he wasn't, he never used a 350 swing weight. Uh, I'll make a video on Roger too, don't worry. It's kind of like the difference between someone using a 330 against a 350. The 350 swing weight will automatically at any rack dead speed have more plow through and be able to hit the ball back with more pace and more spin just naturally, just by transfer of momentum, just by impulse just by inertial differences. Even though it's only 
we're just very sensitive to swing weight and how our strokes work. That's just, again, that's just how he hits through some of the greatest of all time players. He's got just one of the best baseline games, I think, especially on a hard court of all time. So it absolutely has to do with his swing weight. That's a huge cornerstone of his game. But the next big thing is his twist weight, at least 17 or likely closer to 20, just because it's hard to know what exactly his stock racket specs are. We just don't know that. I mean, I can base it off the liquid metal radical specs, but I'm not sure exactly what the weight is of his stock frame is. So, you know, this is just a ballpark estimate, but it's dramatically higher than everyone else. It just is. He's got huge amounts of weight on the sides. The trade off there is maneuverability. Now, if you've seen the other videos, you understand that a high twist weight gives you more forgiveness. Basically, basically what he's getting with a high, super high twist weight is he's getting the forgiveness of like an oversized racket, like a super stable oversized racket, but with all of the control, with all of the ball control, because the string bed is so small and it's of a 95 square inch frame. So it's kind of like the best of both worlds. So on the return, that's really where it's going to help on the return and on heavy jumping balls against Nadal. I mean, case in point for swing weight and twist weight working well for Novak, 2016 Doha, was it? against, or Abu Dhabi or whatever, against Rafael Nadal, I'll probably leave the highlights down below. He just went through all of his balls. He just buttered those balls down. I mean, there was nothing Nadal could do and Nadal wasn't playing badly. He wasn't hitting the ball softly at all. Novak just crammed those balls like he was playing ping pong. How does this help his returns though? Let's talk about a couple other players who had high twist weight. Andre Agassi, POG oversized, had a 16, at least a 16 twist weight. All that extra forgiveness just gives you... Now, Bandian, pretty sure he had a high twist weight too. I don't know what the specs are exactly, just because sometimes with pro stocks, you can get into some weird numbers really easily. But it's pretty safe to bet that regardless of what the stock frame was, going up to a 370, even if all the frame is right under the tip, you're going to have a pretty high twist weight as a result. Now, what's important to note here is that it's going to come at a cost of maneuverability. J changing the racket face angle up into the ball uh, as you're taking the racket back, all those kind of things becomes much more difficult to do. And one thing that's really important to note about his twist weight is it's much higher than someone like Pete Sampras's. Pete Sampras didn't have a low twist weight. That helped give him better forgiveness on volleys. So he has like kind of like a almost like a bigger racket with all the control of that 90 square inch. But this is much higher than that. Something that a lot of people criticize him about are his volleys. Absolutely, in my experience and everyone who I've given a super high twist weight over like 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, even I've gone up to 25, volleys become just super hard to nail down because you need, it's not about, it's not simply about getting the racket out in front, it's about how you angle the racket. If you can't make that minute adjustment right at the last second, you're not gonna be able to get the spin, you're not gonna be able to get it right where you want the ball. So is Novak actually a bad volleyer? I would probably guess not. It's probably more to do with how just absurd his racket is. And just like with the other great returners, it just gives him more forgiveness. Meaning when he has this high of a twist weight, all he needs to do is make sure the ball makes contact with the strings. And with his high swing weight, he's going to be able to hit through the ball there. And then with the high recoil weight, he doesn't even have to make sure the racket has a lot of speed. He can just let it block back, kind of. This combination of high recoil weight as a result of high swing weight and a high twist weight, high polar moment of inertia, high si side to side stability, however you want to call it, kind of makes his racket almost into like a majestic Captain America shield of magical returning or something. It's 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 really, when you use these kinds of specs, this, this high of a swing weight and this high of a twist weight, you really can let the racket do the work for you, especially on the return. You just use your opponent's pace, especially with natural gut strings where you have a lot of elasticity and a lot of spring back. You can just use your opponent's pace against them. And then you can, that opens you up to being able to approach returning differently. Rather than trying to speed up your racket into the ball, you just kind of think about where, where are they going to serve to? What is their pattern? What, what are their tells for what serve is going to come next? It just opens up your return game. That super high swing weight also comes into that recoil weight. As we talked about, he's up to close to 188, 187, close to 190. The trade-off is that the, high, the swing weight becomes very high. I don't think Novak would be quite as successful if we were playing back in the early 90s, just because this racket would be super cumbersome. 
that extra fraction of a second that these slower courts provide, I think absolutely he's something that he takes advantage, full advantage of. And that's something that you should applaud him for because that's really difficult to do. In regards to recoil weight, sometimes you'll see him on defense, he just, he doesn't take a big cut at the ball like Nadal does. He kind of just blocks the ball back from far back deep. He uses his slice, he uses, he uses variety. And he uses a lower racketed speed in defensive positions and he can afford to because his, his recoil weight and his swing weight are so high that he can use a low racketed speed and still generate a lot of power and still have plenty of control. He uses it also on offense because he's just able to hit through some of the biggest shots on tour without any kind of problem. What he does to guys like John Isner and Thomas Burdick and all sorts of people off the serve, off the forehand, it's ridiculous. No one else does it. And it really has to do with his specs because without these specs, there's no way he'd be able to do it. Finally, I wanna talk about where the weight is placed. He's got some long, long, long strips placed at three and nine. So they drape over to the 10 and two position and they go down under. One thing that happens when you go down below the three and nine position is you really get a hit on maneuverability. That's something that I'll have to talk about in another video because we're already at 20 something minutes of But one thing that a lot of people don't know is that he actually has weight placed at roughly the seven inch location. He's got that thick lead tape underneath his grip and that's not a coincidence. P1 absolutely did that to speed up the racket through contact. That's what MGRI tuning is really about. MGRI tuning is all about helping get that racket where you need it to be in relation to your wrist, in relation to your arm, right up into contact. So does he necessarily have a 21.0 MGRI value? No, but MGRI is totally relational in my opinion depending on your arm length, depending on your arm weight, depending on even your, even on the weight or lack of sweatband that you have on your wrist, all of that is gonna change how much MGRI you need, especially your grip and your technique, especially, I'll try to find the link to the picture where you can see the weight underneath his grip and I'll put it down below. If I don't, it will come up in another video. I just don't wanna use someone else's pictures in this video. Lastly, like I've said before, none of these things happen without a give and a take. In physics, there's always an equal and opposite reaction. In this case, a lot of it is increasing your, the difficulty of using this frame. So how Novak combats this has a lot to do with his technique. So this is something, being able to understand what techniques he really uses that correlate with this equipment helps you understand what you can try to do. You know, trying to set up a racket that will fit the way you hit the ball or even beyond that, learning how to adjust what you need to adjust your game to make a higher swing weight or a higher twist weight or whatever work a little bit better. And so one of the first things is compared to Rafa and Roger, and this is something I'll have to talk about more, is he's got a compact bent arm forehand and he's got the two-hander. That's more compact, quicker to use. They have uh, greater initial acceleration, but they don't quite have the same peak racket at speed. And as a side note on the two-hander, what I've noticed with my two-hander is a higher twist weight and a higher swing weight absolutely helps. It's a, it's a huge booster. So he's got that compact bent arm forehand and he's got a very direct path forward into the ball. He uses his grip, he uses a semi-western or a full western, depending on who you ask. It's either, it would definitely be an extreme semi. He uses the grip to produce um, a really steep racket face angle uh, through the ball so that he can generate all that top spin, but he still has such a direct path that he's still hitting with a very flat trajectory. And that has to do a lot with the string bed he's using. He doesn't get underneath the ball quite the same way Roger and Rafa do. And as a result, the way he produces spin has a lot more to do with how he deforms the ball and crushes the ball to increase surface area so he can grab the ball rather than getting the strings up underneath and forcing them into the ball a little bit differently. I think that also what's important to note is that he uses that semi-western grip. Like the semi-western grips and the full western grips are really gonna help with these lower MGRI rackets, uh, in my opinion, and through what I found with other players and other opinions on the internet, it's pretty, pretty consistent that these grips can use a much laggier racket more effectively. And I think that absolutely helps, especially with his strike path, those two combined, I think those two really help with this super high twist weight rack that he has, this super low maneuverability, doesn't get affected because of the way he swings at the ball. Um, he also has a very open stance on his forehand and that's really gonna help because he doesn't have this long take back. Robin Soderling, he really wasn't able to fully exploit this 
racket until he got some really, really slow conditions. Otherwise on faster surfaces, it's not that he couldn't swing full speed into the ball and just couldn't tee off on the ball. It's just that he couldn't do it as often. Um, Novak uses a super, super open stance to give him a little bit more time, not only on the recovery and that his amazing, amazing, amazing footwork, but to help him get the racket into contact just that much quicker, especially with that bent arm forehand. That's something, again, I will talk about in a future video, but we're just still trying to lay some groundwork here. And finally, I would say that the other thing that's really important to look at is he's got a larger grip size to help with that higher twist weight. That's why in the older days, the higher twist weight, there's, there's a misconception and Tennis Warehouse has perpetuated this with one of Andy Gerst's uh, kind of informational videos is that uh, bigger grip or holding the grip, the racket tighter will reduce the spinning of the racket. Physics and tech of tennis have completely busted that myth. It's not true. It just helps with aligning the racket and that's really important. How much the racket is gonna spin in your hand is completely just related to the twist weight. It doesn't have to do with stiffness and it doesn't have to do with how tight you hold the grip. It doesn't have, doesn't have to do with how big the grip is either. With a bigger grip or a tighter grip, the racket might spin less after the contact. The initial twisting, that's what's really important. That's what where you lose power on the ball and all that stuff. That's completely related to the twist weight. So this bigger grip definitely will help kind of what like what I talked about in another video. It will help him adjust that racket face that much easier. He's at like four and a half with two over grips and that's a lot bigger, especially compared to Rafa and Roger who have Rafa has a four and a quarter and Roger has a four and three eighths. So it's a, it's a big step up. So hopefully this video gives you kind of some context and kind of helps you think about how these things can actually improve your game. A lot of people have been saying, you know, the, the, all the things you've been talking about really doesn't improve your game. And some people have actually improved, some people haven't. This is how you can conceptually apply these changes in inertia to your game. How you can change the way you play on court. Think of Novak. He's one of the best returners, one of the best retrievers. He can hit through almost anyone's shots when he's on offense. He's got an all around game, but it has to do with how well he's mastered a racket that's actually fairly hard to use at that level. At a rec level, it'll be easier to use technically because the ball speed that you're dealing with is lower. You have a lower incoming ball speed and what you actually need to do with the ball in return is much less. So that's another topic that we'll get to, but we're gonna have more videos about the pros specifically, and hopefully this rather long video is something you'll find interesting.